What's up everybody, Dr. Ryan here, hope you and your family are well. Thank you for joining me even as we navigate our way into the next portion of examination of the neurological system. We're looking at how to examine the limbs, neurologically speaking. Alright, this is the outline of our talk today, uh, examination of the upper limbs. We're going to be talking about motor examination and outlining the approach and technique to this including the subheadings of inspection, tone, power, and reflexes, looking at the sensory examination of the upper limbs, the cerebellar and peripheral nerve examination as well. Then we head to the lower limbs. We're going to cover just a uh, touch on a few kinds of gait. Then look at the motor examination, the sensory exam, cerebellar and peripheral nerves. Fasten your seatbelts, everybody. Let's get going. So with regard to neurological history taking, we've already covered this in a previous video. So I encourage you to go back and to have a look at that. But we're just purely talking about how to approach examination of the upper limbs, all right? So first up, you want to shake the patient's hands firmly. Hello, sir. How do you do? And then ask him or her to sit over the side of the bed facing you if possible. All right. So as usual in medicine, when you're approaching examination, it's good to first to step back, go to the head end of the bed and just observe. Inspect first for wasting, and if there is wasting, you want to know whether it's a particular pattern, whether it's symmetrical wasting on the left compared to the right or the right compared to the left. Then look for wasting proximally versus distally and check for any fasciculations. Don't forget to include the shoulder girdle in your examination. Then you want to ask the patient to hold the hands out, palms up, with the arms extended, and close the eyes, all right? So the hands are basically supinated like so, right? And then you want to look for drifting of one or both arms. Now, this is what we call the pronated drift. Now, if indeed there is a pronated drift, that could signify upper motor neuron weakness, a cerebellar lesion, or posterior column loss, right? Also, at the same time, you note any tremor or pseudoarthrosis due to proprioceptive loss. Usually the patient uh, does these searching movements because they can't perceive where their joint is in space. So this is typically how you're going to do it. So you test for arm drift, shut your eyes and hold your arms straight out and now turn your palms upwards. All right, and you look for drifting. All right, then, so we're done with inspection. Now you go to feel. You got to feel the muscle bulk next, both proximally and distally, and you note any muscle tenderness. Watch out in case of myositis. Test the tone at the wrists and elbows by passively moving the joint at varying velocities, right? So you gotta move the joint at different speeds, right? Because you wanna assess resistance to movement, which essentially is tone. And assess power as well at the shoulders, elbows, wrists, and fingers. We're gonna have a look at that. And if indicated, you wanna test for the ulnar nerve lesion, something we call a Froman's sign, and a median nerve lesion, something we call a pin touching test. Then you want to examine the reflexes, the biceps, of course, that's the spinal level of C5, C6, the triceps being C7, C8, the brachioradialis, C5, C6. All right. And lastly, you want to assess coordination with finger-nose testing and look for dysteatococinesis. You know the story. And rebound. But we're going to have a closer look at that. Okay, how, how, everybody, how do we grade muscle power? It's called the medical Research Council Scale, MRC, it's graded from 0 through to 5, so 0 speaks to no muscle contraction visible, 1 is where there's just a flicker of contraction, but no movement, uh, grade 2 is joint movement when the effect of gravity is eliminated, so the, the limb essentially moves but can't leave the bed, right, it's stuck onto the bed because it can't overcome gravity. Right. Number three is movement against gravity, but not against the examiner's resistance. So they are able to overcome gravity so they can move the limb off the bed, but they can't overcome any resistance that you offer. Number four is movement against resistance, but subnormal, which means it's weaker than normal. Grade five is normal power. So essentially, when you're testing uh, power at the shoulders, I like to ask the patient to put the arms out, you know, like an airplane. You know how the airplane goes? Right, and what you ask the patient to do is to push out against you or push upwards against you. Right, that's testing shoulder abduction, and then to bring the shoulders in against you, that's shoulder adduction. All right, 
And uh, then with the elbow, you ask the patient to bend the elbow and then push against you. Stop me from straightening your elbow, right? That's going to be for elbow extension. And then when you ask the patient to bring the, the elbow in, that's elbow flexion. So on the left here is elbow flexion, on the right, elbow extension, okay? Then with wrist extension, like so in the picture, you ask the patient to cock the wrist up and to push against you, stop me from bending your wrist, and the other direction for wrist flexion, okay? This is testing finger flexion, as on the left, squeeze my fingers hard, but don't offer more than two fingers. And then finger abduction, as depicted, stop me from pushing your fingers together, all right? Now, guys, when we're assessing muscle stretch reflexes, it's created as shown. So zero is absent. One plus speaks to the reflex being present but reduced. Two plus is normal. Three plus is where the reflex is increased, possibly normal. And four plus is where it's greatly increased and often associated with clonus. So the key is that you want to grasp the patella hammer. And there's different kinds. You've got the queen square hammer. You've got the Taylor hammer. But this here is, is, is a queen square hammer, which is depicted in the picture. So you want to grasp it, not right at the end, maybe uh, two thirds down the length of the hammer and allow gravity to do most of the movement, okay? Then what's illustrated on the left in picture A is the biceps jerk. So you place um, your thumb over the biceps tendon in the cubital fossa and then you allow the tendon hammer to strike your thumb, all right? And then triceps depicted in picture B, the same, but here you allow the hammer to strike over the triceps tendon and you're looking for contraction of the triceps muscle, right? And in picture C is a supinated jerk. So that illustrates the technique. Okay, then of course, that was depicted in figure A on the bottom, on the left-hand side is a Hoffman sign, right? And a finger jerk in picture B, all right. So we also have these superficial abdominal reflexes. So you stroke basically with your patella hammer in the directions as shown in the picture. And if the abdominal reflexes are indeed present, uh, so rather if they are absent, then that is abnormal. It usually happens in the setting of upper motor neuron lesion. All right, so this is testing coordination. So it's called a finger nose test. So you ask the patient to touch their nose with their forefinger and then reach out and touch your finger, right? And then you're gonna move your finger to varying distances and see whether the patient can indeed, um, you know, touch your finger. You're looking for pass pointing, which is dysmetria, and you're looking for tremor as the patient's finger approaches the target, which is your forefinger, all right? And that would mean that the sign is positive and signifies a cerebellar issue. Then you want to test for dystatocokinesis. So you ask the patient to turn the hand over backwards and forwards on the other one as quickly and as smoothly as possible. And, and if they can't do that in a coordinated way, then that speaks to a cerebellar lesion. So this is illustrating the finger nose test again. And note in picture A how um, you know the patient's touching their nose with their forefinger, then touching the examiner's forefinger. And in picture B, how the examiner is then moving. Uh, you know, their forefinger at varying distances from the patient to test for dysmetria. Okay, so what's depicted in a picture on the left is a wrist drop. It's a left radial nerve palsy with a wrist drop. And here, even with the wrist support, the patient's still unable to actively extend their fingers and thumb at the metacarpophalangeal joints, right? What's depicted on the top, on the right, is the distribution of sensory loss that you expect with specific peripheral nerve lesions of the upper limb. So you can see distribution of the uh, lateral two and a half digits is taken by the median nerve, okay? The la uh, and the medial one and a half digits are taken by the ulnar nerve, and the radial essentially has most of the uh, dorsal aspect of the hand. So what's illustrated uh, on the bottom on the right here is a pen touching test, which depicts loss of abductor pollicis brevis, right? So you ask the patient to lift their thumb straight up to touch your pen, Right, and of course, we know that innervation of this is taken by the median nerve. So this will illustrate a palsy of the median nerve if the patient can't do the pin touching test. Alrighty, so as we know, everybody, motor weakness can be due to either upper motor neuron lesion, a lower motor neuron lesion, or indeed a myopathy. And if indeed there is evidence of a lower motor neuron lesion, you want to consider whether this is anterior horn cell, 
nerve root or brachial plexus lesion, whether it's a peripheral nerve lesion or if it's a motor peripheral neuropathy. Again, this is how we compare some of these headings head to head, taken from McLeod. It's a beautiful table, right? So we're going to look at each of these in terms of the anatomical etiology, the associated features, and the common causes. So in low motor neuron lesions, often what you have is wasting on inspection together with fasciculations. You have hypotonia, and the reflexes are diminished or absent. And the most common claims to fame for this etiology are peripheral neuropathies or morning neuropathies. Watch out for morning neuritis multiplex. It's one of the uh, features of diabetic neuropathy. Don't forget about radiculopathies, anterior horn cell damage, as in poliomyelitis, or motor neuron disease. Then the second heading is upper motor neuron lesion. Here what we see is a so-called patterned weakness with flexed arm and extended leg. Flexed arm and extended leg, and that speaks to the pyramidal pattern of weakness, right? There's no muscle wasting, there's hyperreflexia, and there's hypertonia, right? And the common causes of this are stroke, stroke, and more stroke, spinal cord pathology, multiple sclerosis, right, and brain tumor. And myopathies usually cause proximal muscle weakness, weakness of the shoulder girdle and weakness of the well, pectoral and pelvic girdle. So the patient complains, you know what, I have difficulty hanging up clothes or I have difficulty reaching up to a high shelf to get something. Uh, I have difficulty waking up from a seated position. And those speak to weakness of the pectoral and the pelvic girdle specifically. And a, a, examples of etiologies for myopathy are muscular dystrophies, inflammatory myopathies, corticosteroids, alcohol, there's a whole a lot of them. Uh, then the last category is functional weakness, which is only weakness in an inconsistent pattern. And there you may have no hard neurological signs. Usually happens in the setting of conversion disorders. Okay, looking at the sensory exam of the upper limb, the spinal thalamic tract is supposed to say spinal thalamic there. Sorry about that. Okay, so first you want to test the spinal thalamic pathway, which subserves the modalities, the sensory modalities of pain and temperature. So you demonstrate to the patient the sharpness of a pin on the anterior chest wall. You say, ma'am, this is what this normally feels like. Can you perceive that? All right, then ask him or her to close the eyes and you test a sensation on the limb and you ask if the sensation is sharp or dull. All right, so you wanna start proximally and test each dermatome. On a subsequent slide, we're gonna look at the different dermatomes and you wanna map out any abnormal area. As you are assessing, you want to try to fit that sensory loss into either one of four patterns. Uh, is it a dermatomal pattern speaking to a cord or a nerve root lesion? Is it a peripheral nerve? Is it peripheral neuropathy in the way of glove, uh, like you know, the area where you use your gloves, right? Is it peripheral neuropathy where you have sensory loss in that distribution? Or is it hemisensory speaking to cortical or cord distribution, all right? So guys, this is an illustration from Charlie O'Connor speaking to you know the different um, dermatomes in the upper limb so an easy way to remember it right so c5 is the lateral outer arm right c6 is the lateral outer forearm c7 is basically the middle finger which is quite rude right c8 is the medial hand all right and uh, c7 is the, the medial forearm and T1 is going to be the medial arm. So once again, C5 is lateral outer arm, C6 is lateral forearm, C7 is middle finger, C8 is medial hand, all right, uh, and then, sorry, C, and C7 is your medial hand, C8 is your medial forearm, and T1 is going to be your medial arm. All right, and then coming on to the thorax, they say that uh, T4 is the level of the nipples, but that's quite variable as we know. <laughs> yeah, for obvious reasons, obvious, right? So T7 is going to be the level of the xiphus sternum, right? Roughly T10 is umbilicus and T12 is suprapubic area. All right, and so this is a very busy slide, but it shows us um, basically all the peripheral nerves in the body. Now on the left, we look at the anterior portion and the left, the posterior portion of the body, right? Okay, so this on the left here is illustrating how we test for pinprick sensation with a disposable neurology pin. Remember, you've got to ask the patient, does it feel sharp or blunt and you compare symmetrically, all right? And on the on the right, we're looking at pain and temperature pathway. So this is a spanathalamic tract. So I want everybody to note the level of decussation. Decussation means crossing over. All right, so level of decussation in the spinal thalamic tract is at the level of the spinal cord. All right, so this means that if you have spinal cord transaction at any point, right, 
you can have a, a loss of pain and temperature sensation contralaterally. Right? That's the clinical implication of that. All right, so continuing next modality I want to test from a sensory perspective is the posterior column pathway, also called the dorsal column medium and viscous pathway, and that subserves the sensory modalities of vibration and proprioception. And proprioception is simply joint position. Where are your joints in space? Tell me. Proprioception, right? So let's look at vibration first. So you want to use 128 hertz tuning fork. In my previous video, I said 128 hertz tuning fork for the Rene, and we would test as incorrect. I do apologize. It's a 256 hertz tuning fork for testing of the eighth nerve. But here we're using 128 hertz tuning fork to assess vibration sense. You want to place the vibrating fork on a distal interphalangeal joint the DIP joint, when the patient has the eyes closed, and ask whether that vibration can be felt or not. If so, ask the patient to tell you when the vibration ceases, and then after a short wait, you want to stop the vibrations. And if the patient has deficient sensation, you want to test more proximally at the wrist, then at the elbow, and then subsequently at the shoulder. Looking at proprioception, you want to examine proprioception first with the distal interphalangeal joint of the little finger. So when the patient has the eyes open, you grasp the distal phalanx from the sides, okay, like so from the sides and move it up or down to demonstrate and then ask the patient to shut the eyes and repeat the maneuver. Normally movement through even a few degrees is detectable and the patient can actually tell you whether it is up or down. If however there is an abnormality you want to test larger amplitude movements and then proceed to test the wrists and elbows similarly if necessary. So in this diagram, you see it's a bit different from the spinal dynamic tract in that the level of decussation of fibers occurs higher up at the medulla. So the clinical implication here is that if you have a spinal cord lesion above the particular spinal cord uh, level of interest, then you're going to have loss of vibration and proprioception in the dorsal column tract ipsilaterally, versus the spinal dynamic tract where the loss is going to be contralateral. All right, let's talk about light touch. So thereafter, you want to test light touch with the cotton wool. We want to touch the skin lightly. We don't stroke it, we touch it, and we go to each dermatome. Remember C5, C6, C7, Z8, T1, T2, T7, T10, T12. And you want to feel for thickened nerves. Get those thickened nerves in there, man. And there's quite a good differential for thickened nerves, right? You test the ulnar nerve at the, in the ulnar groove at the elbow. You test the median nerve at the wrist and the radial at the wrist as well. And feel the axilla if there's evidence of a proximal lesion, right? So no cause of thickened nerves, very important, leprosy to exclude, Charcot-Marie tooth, okay, sarcoidosis, um, amyloidosis, there's a few others as well. Note any scars and finally examine the neck if relevant. So peripheral nerve lesion, so on the left is depicted your sensory and motor involvement if there's a median nerve lesion. Remember that the, we talk about the pen touching test, okay? And remember that um, you're going to lose sensation in the lateral three and a half digits if it's median nerve affectation. And the motor component is that you're going to lose your abductor uh, pollicis brevis and your opponent's uh, pollicis. So you know that the median nerve provides motor innervation to the so-called loaf muscles, the two lateral lumbricals, the opponent's pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis brevis already. If you have affectation of the radial nerve as depicted in picture B, then you can have loss of sensation in the so-called anatomical snuff box area. And remember that the radial nerve is motor to the finger extensors, the thumb extensors and abductors, the wrist extensors and the brachioradialis. On, in, in picture C, we look at the ulnar nerve distribution. So the ulnar nerve innervates from a sensory perspective the medial two and a half digits. And in terms of motor dysfunction, it, it, um, it based the ulnar nerve innervates the small muscles, the small intrinsic muscles in the hand, all of them with the exception, the exception of abductor pollicis brevis, which is taken by the median nerve. It also innervates the ulnar half of flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor carpi ulnaris. Okay, shifting gears now. <laughs> Let's talk about examination of the lower limb. So first up, you want to test the stance and the gait first if possible, and then put the patient in bed with the legs entirely exposed. Place the towel over the groin and note obviously where the urinary catheter is present, which may speak to incontinence, an important clue. All right, so this is some common gait abnormalities. We just need to quickly glance at this. So in Parkinsonian gait, 
it's, the patient often has a stooped posture. They have shuffling gait with a reduced stride length. They have loss of arm swing. They have postural instability and freezing. And the most common cause of that is Parkinson's disease and other Parkinsonian syndromes. Gait apraxia happens when there's small shuffling steps, something we call march a petit pas. Mm, quite French, right? French is lovely. And, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, some je ne sais quoi. <laughs> so there's difficulty in starting to walk and freezing and have uh, cycling on the bed and then walking. Okay, and this often happens in the setting of cerebrovascular disease and hydrocephalus. Spastic paraparesis we have and when the patient has a stiff kind of gait walking through mud or a scissoring gait and that speaks to a spinal cord lesion. Myopathic gait is typically waddling because that speaks to proximal weakness of the uh, pectoral, oh, sorry, the pelvic girdle. I may have bilateral to Nillenberg signs and the uh, causes of that is muscular dystrophy and acquired myopathies. If you see a patient with a foot drop with foot slapping, that speaks to neuropathy and uh, alpha radiculopathy. If there's sentinel ataxia, we have a wide based so-called drunken gait with poor tandem walking and cerebellar disease is to blame. If you have sensory ataxia, we speak about a wide based gait with a positive Romberg sign. And what causes that is neuropathy and spinal cord disorders. If you have a functional gait, it's variable, often bizarre and inconsistent. Happens with the knees flexed and buckling. And often you see the patient trying to drag an immobile leg behind them. And that happens in the setting of conversion disorder. So looking at motor exam for the lower limbs, everybody. So first up, step back, inspect the limbs, right? Uh, uh, looking for muscle wasting and fasciculation. If there's wasting, you compare it symmetrically and proximally to distally. Note any tremor and feel the muscle bulk of the quadriceps. Run your hand up each chin, feeling for wasting of those beautiful anterior tibial muscles. When it comes to tone, you want to test the tone at knees and ankles. Remember, you're moving the, those particular joints at varying velocities, looking for resistance to stretch. And you want to, if indeed you think the tone is increased, you want to test clonus at the same time. Don't miss the opportunity for check for clonus at this point. You want to push the lower end of the quadriceps sharply downwards toward the knee, and you note sustained rhythmical contractions, which would indicate, if present, an upper motor neuron lesion. You also want to test the ankle tone by sharply dorsiflexing the foot with the knee bent and the thigh externally rotated. In terms of power, you want to assess power next at the hips, knees, and ankles. So this is, remember, the MRC grading of power, which was grade 0 up to grade 5. So this is illustrating hip flexion. So you ask the patient to lift your leg up and don't let me push it down. Okay, so this test is for hip flexion, all right? And for hip extension, we say, you ask the patient, push your heel down, don't let me pull it up. Right? And likewise, hip abduction, don't let me push your hip, hip in. So you ask the patient to separate the legs, don't let me push it in. And the opposite for hip adduction, bring your legs together, don't let me push it apart. Okay, this is testing knee extensions. So you instruct the patient, straighten your knee and don't let me bend it and push hard. Right? And here we're saying knee flexion, so you bend your knee and don't let me straighten it and you pull hard. This is demonstrating uh, plantar flexion of the ankle. You suck the patient, don't let me push your foot up, and you're going to oppose the movement. And this is um, some dirty feet there. <laughs> <laughs> but illustrating uh, uh, power with ankle dorsiflexion, don't let me push your foot down. Okay, and this is looking at eversion and inversion. So to test the tarsal joint or ankle eversion, you ask the patient to stop turning me, uh, uh, turning, stop me turning your foot inwards, and you... you uh, test the power as shown and on the right testing ankle inversion stop me turning your foot upwards and you oppose the movement as shown all right so a quick test a quick test if you don't have much time to test for lower limb power you ask the patient to stand up on their toes and now lift up your uh, uh, on your heels and squat and stand up again and if all these movements are well performed you can safely you know know that the power in the lower limbs is five out of five then you elicit your reflexes and remember the knee reflex is taken by the spinal cord uh, roots L3 and L4, the ankle taken by S1 and S2, and a plantar response by L5, S1, S2. So guys, I want to show you a quick and easy way to know this, right? So just think about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. <laughs> so your ankle reflex is taken by uh, spinal nerve levels L1, L2, the knee by L3, L4, right? The biceps by C5, C6, and the triceps by C7, C8. So, once again, easy, right? Ankle reflex L1, L2, knee reflex L3, L4, bicep C5, uh, C6, tricep C7, C8, easy as that. So here is illustrating the proper technique for eliciting the knee jerk uh, reflex, which is L3, L4. 
right? So you, the key here is that you got to get the patient to relax. So you feel the weight of their leg on your non-dominant hand. Tell the patient, relax. And if you're not eliciting the reflex first time, use Gendrastic's maneuver, which is a reinforcement maneuver. So you ask the patient to bite their teeth or clench their teeth, or they can maybe put their hands together and pull apart like so. That distracts the patient. So you are sure that the patient is completely relaxed. And they have to be completely relaxed for you to elicit the reflex. And remember, you are looking for contraction of the quadriceps muscle. The quads are the strongest muscle in the body. So here on the right-hand side, it's illustrating the knee jerk with the reinforcement, which is what we call gymnastics maneuver. Now, here we're looking at the proper technique to elicit the Achilles reflex or the ankle reflex. You gotta dorsiflex the foot slightly to stretch the tendon, all right, as shown. And here is illustrating uh, your plantar support. All right, uh, and you check whether that's positive. The result is positive if you are fanning off the toes and you have uh, dorsiflexion of the big toe, right? That speaks to our upper motion neuron lesion being present. Okay, then you want to go on and examine coordination with the heel shin test, the toe finger test, tapping of the feet, and the Romberg test, all right? And this is demonstrating tandem walking or heel toe walking. A patient with cerebellar lesion won't be able to do this. They'll start staggering and becoming ataxic. The Romberg test is illustrated here. You stand, ask the patient to stand with your feet together and now shut your eyes. I won't let you fall. All right, so now if the patient has proprioceptive loss, you know, with the eyes closed, they're going to start getting, uh, you know, feeling imbalanced and will be unsteady. And that's a positive Romberg sign. It speaks to proprioceptive loss, right? And if it's a cerebellar lesion, remember that they're going to be unsteady, uh, both of the eyes open and the eyes closed. Okay, here's the heel shin test. You ask the patient to run your heel down your shin smoothly and quickly. And, and it should be a nice coordinated movement. If they can't do that or if they tend to, you know, wobble and are imbalanced, then that's a, a positive heel shin test and that speaks to cerebellar lesion. Next up, we examine the sensory system as for the upper limb. So look at the modalities of pimpric, vibration, proprioception, light touch. So, you know, pimpric and light touch are taken by the spinal thalamic tract, vibration, proprioception by the, by the, by the, dorsal collar medium lumniscus. Now, if indeed there is peripheral sensory loss, you want to attempt to establish a sensory level by moving the pin up the leg and onto the abdomen as is necessary and onto the chest. Then you want to examine sensation in the saddle region and test the anal reflex if indicated to observe the levels of S2, 3, and 4. So this is a nice diagram from Tally and O'Connor right, illustrating the distribution of the dermatomes in the lower limb. So basically, uh, if I can get my pin in there, so L1 essentially high up, L2 is the upper outer thigh, L3 is the area around the knees, L4 is the medial leg, L5 is the lateral leg going up to the dorsum of the foot, S1 is basically the lateral portion of the dorsum of the foot and most of the plantar aspect of the foot, that's S1, S2 is most of the posterior thigh, thigh sorry not thigh, <laughs> and S3, 4, 5 is perianal. So once again, L2 is up out of thigh, L3 is region here, which is your medial thigh, just around the knee. L4 is your medial leg, L5 your lateral leg, S1 is the lateral dorsum of the foot, and most of the plantar aspect of the foot. S2 is your posterior thigh and leg, and S3, 4, 5, perineal. Okay, so this is just illustrating how you're testing for pain sensation in the lower limbs, right? Don't press too hard, don't want to make the patient bleed now. And uh, this is illustrating the technique for testing vibration sense. So you first demonstrate over the sternum and then you compare at the joints uh, symmetrically. And then you, just like how we described before for the upper limbs already. And uh, this is testing proprioception, just like how we mentioned before for the upper limbs. But here we're grasping the distal phalanx from the lateral aspects, moving up and down and asking the patient to shut the eyes and tell you if you have moved their toe up or down. And this is demonstrating uh, touch sensation. Cotton wool can be used as an alternative to not stroke the skin. Okay, and then you have to lastly go to the back and look for any deformities, scars, and neurofibromas, palpate for tenderness over the vertebral bodies, auscultate for bruise, and perform the straight leg raising test, which is the test for sciatica. So looking at peripheral nerve lesions in the lower limbs, on the left we have involvement of the common peroneal. So its sensory involvement is in that particular area, right, that's depicted, right? And it's motor to the toe dorsiflexes, the foot dorsiflexes and the foot everters, right? On the right, we see the innervation of the natural cutaneous nerve of thigh, which is purely sensory. It doesn't have any motor innervation, and it's sensory to this portion of the thigh, right? The uh, anterior portion of the thigh. Okay. 
Beloved, as always, please allow me to encourage you. I'm speaking to uh, us being dead to the world. Galatians 6.14 declares, this is what Paul is saying. He says, I will boast in nothing else but only in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For by means of the cross, this world is dead to me and I am dead to the world. I want to ask you, can a dead man feel? No, a dead man can't feel. So if we are dead to the world, we are dead to everything the world has to offer. Therefore, we should not become offended with people. We will not become discouraged. We will not become upset with people. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us and we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, the Bible says that we are the lights of the world and the salt of the earth. And I pray that we will crucify carnality and the flesh man so that we can live for Christ. Have yourself a wonderful day. These are my references. Let me just move this out of the way so you can see. Thank you so much. God bless you and have yourself a wonderful day. I'll see you soon uh, with the next video, which I'll be covering, uh, just honing into the cerebellar system. And thereafter, we'll be talking a bit about uh, Parkinson's. God bless you.